Assalamualaikum everyone and thank you very much to the whole committee for inviting me to this amazing conference and uh, um, again thank you. So I've been asked to talk about meniscal allograft transplantation. Um, hopefully that means that you are getting allografts in Pakistan now but I will go through this uh, as swiftly as I can. So we all know the importance of the meniscus and is they're not just shock absorbers. They very cleverly distribute the load. And the effect of taking this out, we've all seen in our clinics with all these symptoms, and you can represent them graphically very easily as to how much, I think, these, this PowerPoint is not work, working, but you could see the bottom right, the peak stresses when you take a meniscectomy meniscus out. And you increase the contact stress by over 130%. So here's an x-ray, someone 24 years after bilateral meniscectomies. If you have had a meniscectomy and your ACL is deficient, there's almost a 100% chance of OA at some point. So what are our options? Synthetic grafts and allografts. So synthetic grafts gave us much hope. So they've come and gone and come and gone and sort of coming back again. Active Fit has had a number of reiterations. It was a relatively straightforward operation to do. We've got Tim Spaulding, who's an internationally renowned uh, surgeon. He does a lot of ACLs. He's done a lot of research. And even in his hands, they haven't had the best of results. And certainly his hands are better than mine. So there have been lots of failures. We were doing it as audit projects. And the new version of the ActiveFit, again, had many failures. And the cumulative survivorship is 63% at six years. And again, there have been warnings at every time. So I think within the synthetic group, there's short-term initial improvement and function, but there's a high fire failure rate, and there is an associated morbidity, and we've got to just think about that. And we can't, unfortunately, recommend it for widespread use, although it's quite attractive that you can have something on the shelf that you can fill volume with. Hopefully, there are things in the future which will make this come a bit easier for us. So long-term survivorship of meniscal transplantation, 85% at two years, 77% at five years, 69% at seven years, and it goes on. There's a number of long-term studies here, and uh, if someone wants to go through them and have a chat afterwards, then I'm more than happy to talk about it over lunch or tea, hopefully. But here are the indications. You've got to pick your patient. Patients under than 50, with a non-functional meniscus, with previous partial near-total meniscectomy, and they're getting symptoms. They've got to have an appropriate alignment or a correctable knee alignment. No ligament pathology, although you can uh, do ACL reconstructions at the same time or before, but they are associated with higher failure rates as will come. These, this is for people with closed physis. And importantly, they've got to comply with your protocol. And again, we'll go through this. To anything else, someone over 50, very arthritic, it doesn't work, unfortunately. You can combine it for things like ACI and osteochondral allografts for chondral defects, although the worldwide supply of osteochondral allografts is very limited. And sometimes my patients are waiting over a year to get an allograft. Then here we comes to come to compliance. So if you have someone who's compliant, they're over six times less likely to need a revision and over seven times more likely to have a successful outcome one to three years post-transplantation. So you really do have to pick your patients. And you just have to have a cautious approach. 
with those people with established, even establishing osteoarthrosis. And that was a consensus statement from the International Meniscus Reconstruction Experts Forum. Consensus statements because they just aren't really enough done to have long-term follow-up, but they are papers, as you'll see. Here's an E4 open review, and some of these patients are followed up to 24 years. The measurements, there's Pollard who's described this measurement. It can be based over a, sim a simple x-ray. However, you must size it correctly. If you oversize it, there's increased load in the joint. If you undersize it, then because of hoop stresses, there's shear forces and you get failure. CT scan has shown some promise that all of the CT scan measurements are within five millimeters, X-ray 76%, and 72% are within two millimeters, and, and much better than X-ray. MRI is not effective. It undersizes up to 44%. And we know that about other measurements, such as a tibial tuberosity tubercular groove distance. MRI isn't always good for measurements. Where do you get your graphs from? Fresh viable graphs, they have great results, but you need to collect them very quickly, rather like when you do ACL allographs. Fresh frozen graphs, lower risk of disease transmission, but then they don't have the active cells as much. Cryopreserved graphs have long life, but the initial results are questionable. And then there's unlimited graph storage techniques, but also their results aren't uh, uh, as good as the rest. Graph fixation, three main method methods. The easiest one technically, and these are difficult operations, is suturoni graphs. A graph with double plug fixation, so the anterior and posterior roots have got plug or bone, and a keyhole technique. And these are, the, like I said, the point is not working, otherwise I would have gone through some points in this. But essentially, now it's working. Excellent. So with the key uh, technique, you've got to just make this bone bridge and you've got to fit this in. With the all suture technique, you can see this is much easier conceptually and then you can do these just like you do your root repairs. And then you can prepare the bone plugs as you want manually for, through a, a whole block that they give you. So which to use? So this was a great meta-analysis of 485 suture only versus 489 bone fixation. And generally, if you see the tears and the failures and the scores and the meniscal extrusion, generally were the same. So the all suture one, you think, okay, it's not such a bad thing to choose something that's easier. So on the medial side, actually the all suture one works okay. If they need an HTO, you need to do an HTO. On the lateral side, because the anterior and posterior roots are so close together, if you use bone plugs, the tunnels can converge, they can break into each other, it's actually more difficult. So that is great to have the keyhole technique for the lateral side. So although you can do all suture techniques, but they're not as successful from a results point of view. And again, I'm more than happy to talk about uh, personal experience uh, over tea or lunch at some point. Rehab, again, they're, those people you're expecting an ideal result, and those are patients with no or minimal chondral damage. And then Tim Spalding's group said you can expect a complete return to sport. If there's advanced chondral damage, then really it's a salvage procedure and the objective of the operation is to reduce pain, not to get them back to playing their sport. And so you can temper your rehab. Divided into three phases, 
early, quite slow, and I managed to get myself an honorary contract to work in the same hospital Tim Spaulding did to see these patients and to see him operate. And uh, I would imagine, I would uh, advise that if you are starting this, go to someone who's done a lot. A lot is just few, uh, but go. Strength and condition the next two to six months and then functional rehab for six to nine months. So at least nine months to a year. Outcomes, here's an objective result of 3,157 allografts. 38% were isolated. The most at least had another procedure. Overall survival rate, 80%. Now compare that to the synthetic graphs. One degenerative uh, change. Other studies, 97% at five years, 82% at uh, uh, five years when there's a full condyle lesion in a one condyle. If you have both condyles affected, it's 62%. Lateral allografts fail at 76%, which is lower than medial at any time point. So if you take any time point, the lateral allograph uh, uh, failure is lower, but probably because less people are using all suture. Progression of OA, again, we've gone through these figures. Uh, so 20% will survive at 15 years, and then they normally are revised to a knee replacement. So in summary, you use for symptomatic meniscal loss, not just because someone's had their meniscus taken out. We've gone through the three fixation methods. On the lateral side, the meniscal allografts are better than the medial, but the medial is still useful. So though the lateral side has better outcomes, it's still worth doing the medial side if the patient is painful. Low-grade chondral lesions have a much better survival, Meniscal extrusion is common, but not significantly uh, influencing the outcome. But even if you have high success, there's a big chance that you won't get back to resume sporting activities. So in summary, as my boss used to say, it's best not to start from there and save the meniscus when you do your scope. Many thanks for your attention.